Chapter Forty Four of Thrilling Narratives of Mutiny, Murder, and Piracy. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Philip Gould. Thrilling Narratives of Mutiny, Murder, and Piracy by Anonymous. Chapter Forty Four. Loss of the Duke William Transport. The Duke William Transport, commanded by Captain Nichols, was fitted out by him with all possible expedition in the year 1758, and lay at Spithead to receive orders. At length he proceeded to Cork under convoy of the York man-of-war to take in soldiers for America, but just on approaching the Irish coast a thick fog came on whereby he lost sight of the ship, and as it began to blow hard that night and the next day, he was obliged to bear away for Waterford. When off Cradenhead, guns were fired for a pilot. None, however, came off, and Captain Nichols, being unacquainted with the harbour, brought the ship up, though the sea ran very high. A pilot at last came on board, but the transport broke from her anchor, and on getting under sail it was almost dark. After running along for some time under the fore topsail, triple reefed and scarce in sight of land, Captain Nichols cast anchor and next morning to his great surprise found high rocks so close astern that he durst not veer away a cable. The sheet anchor had been let go in the night and was the chief means of preservation. The yards and topmasts were now got down, a signal of distress hoisted and many guns fired. A boat then came from the windward and a man in her said if Captain Nichols would give him fifty pounds he would come on board, which, being promised, he ascended the stern ladder. But when he found the ship so near the rocks, he declared that he would not remain on board for all the ship was worth. However, Captain Nichols told him that having come off as a pilot acquainted with the harbor, he should stay, and called to the people in the boat to hoist their sails as he was going to cut her adrift, which he did accordingly. Meantime the pilot was in the greatest confusion, but the captain said it was in vain to complain and if by cutting or slipping the cables he could carry the ship to a place of safety he was ready to do it. The pilot replied that he could neither take charge of her nor venture to carry her in, for he apprehended the ship would be on shore and dash to pieces against the rocks before she would veer, and if she did veer, that a large French East India man had been lost upon the bar, which made the channel very narrow, and he did not know the mark so as to carry her clear of the wreck. The ship now rode very hard, and it being Sunday a great many people were ready on shore to plunder her should she strike. Of this Captain Nichols entertained many apprehensions at low water, as she pitched so much. But fortunately, as the weather became more moderate, two English frigates which lay in the harbour sent their boats to his assistance, and the custom-house smack arriving he escaped, though very narrowly, from the threatened danger. The Duke William soon afterwards proceeded to Cork to receive soldiers, and sailed from thence with a fleet of transports to Halifax, where they arrived safe, and went to besiege Louisbourg. After landing the troops, the transports, and some of the men of war, went into Gabarus Bay, where the Admiral allowed the captains of the former to land their men, being sickly, on a small peninsula which they engaged to defend from the enemy. Four or five hundred people, therefore, immediately set to work and cut a ditch six feet wide and four feet deep, quite across the peninsula as a precaution against the Indians. They planted cannon and also placed several swivels on the stumps of trees cut down for that purpose. Huts were next erected, gardens made, and the whole ground cleared and converted into pleasant arbors from selecting portions of the shrubs and trees. Here the captains of the transports remained some time, during which the sick recovered surprisingly and cures were operated by a remarkable expedient called a ground sweat. This was digging a hole in the ground, and being put into it naked, the earth was thrown over the patient up to the chin for a few minutes. At first the earth felt cold, but it quickly brought on a gentle perspiration which cured the disorder. No one person died who underwent such treatment. On the reduction of Louisbourg, the island of St. John in the entrance of the Gulf of St. Lawrence capitulated, and the inhabitants were to be sent to France in the English transports. They therefore left the peninsula which the people had entrenched, and after much bad weather in which the Duke William parted her cable, and after a tedious passage arrived at St. John's, but not without the whole fleet being in danger of shipwreck. A party of soldiers brought the inhabitants down the country to the different transports, and the Duke William being the largest, the missionary priest, who was the principal man there, was ordered to go with Captain Nichols. 
On his arrival he requested permission for the other people who wished it to come on board to be married, and a great many marriages followed, from an idea prevailing that all the single men would be made soldiers. Nine transports sailed in company, Captain Wilson with Lord Rollo and some soldiers, and Captain Moore also with soldiers under convoy of the hind sloop of war. The rest being cartels had no occasion for convoy. Captain Moore's vessel was lost going through the gut of Canso by striking on a sunken rock, whence the soldiers whom she carried were put on board Captain Wilson's ship bound to Louisbourg. Captain Moore, his son, mate, and carpenter took a passage in the Duke William. Contrary winds obliged the fleet to lie in the gut of Canso, where the French prisoners were permitted to go ashore frequently and remain there all night, making fires in a wood to keep themselves warm, and some of them obtained muskets from Captain Nichols for shooting game, as they were not afraid of meeting with the Indians. About three hours after departing one of them came running back and begged for God's sake that the captain would immediately return on board with his people, as they had met with a party of Indians who were coming down to scalp them. Captain Nichols, with the other masters and sailors, hastily went off and had scarce got on board when the Indians actually reached the place that they had left. Thus they had a very narrow escape of being murdered and scalped had not the French been faithful and providence interposed. The fleet in gaining the gut of Canso had been assailed by dangers. During a fine night some of the transports worked within the gut, but Captain Nichols and Captain Johnson of the Parnassus cast anchor without it. In the night a hard gale arose and increased so much that the latter let go three anchors, yet the ship drove ashore and was lost. Another ship, the Narcissus, also parted from her anchors and was obliged to run ashore, and most of the rest suffered damage. When the weather became somewhat moderate, Captain Nichols found that all the French prisoners on board the Parnassus had gained the land and had made themselves large fires in the woods, on account of the cold, showery weather which prevailed, and on joining them there he told them to their great joy that he would send boats to carry them off. This he did next morning, and finding it impossible to save the hull of the Parnassus, though another ship was got off shore, everything worth saving was taken out of her, and in particular one of the pumps, which was carried on board the Duke William to serve in case of emergency. On the 25th of November, 1758, Captain Nichols sailed from the Bay of Canso, leading six other transports, with a strong breeze at northwest. All the captains agreed to make the best of their way to France and not to go to Louisbourg, as it was a bad time of the year to beat on that coast, and then took leave of the agent who was bound thither. The third day after being at sea a storm blew in the night, being dark with thick weather and sleet, the Duke William parted company with three of the ships, and the storm still continuing, in a day or two parted with the rest. Nevertheless the ship remained in good condition and though the sea was mountains high, she went over it like a bird and made no water. On the 10th of December, Captain Nichols saw a sail which proved to be one of the transports, the Violet, Captain Suggett. On coming up, he asked how all were on board, to which Captain Suggett replied, in a terrible situation. He had a great deal of water in the ship, her pumps were choked, and he was much afraid that she would sink before morning. Captain Nichols begged him to keep up his spirits, and said that if possible he would stay by him and spare him the pump he had got out of the Parnassus. He also told him that as the gale had continued so long he hoped it would moderate after twelve o'clock. Unfortunately, however, it rather increased, and on changing the watch at twelve he found that he went fast ahead of the Violet, whence, if he did not shorten sail, he would be out of sight of her before morning. Captain Nichols then consulted with Captain Moore and the mate on what was the most proper to be done, and all were unanimous, that the only means of saving the people in the Violet was to keep company with her until the weather should moderate, and that the main topsail should be taken in. Therefore the main topsail of the Duke William was taken in, and three pumps got out to be ready in case of necessity. The spare pump was forced down an after hatchway and shipped in an empty butt, of which the French had brought several on board to wash in. Everything was preparing, both for pumping and bailing, should it be required, and the people of the transport thought themselves secure against all hazards. They now believed that the Violet gained on them, and were glad to see her quite plain about four o'clock in the afternoon. On changing the watch, they found the ship still tight and going very well, the carpenter assuring Captain Nichols that there was no water to strike a pump. He, fatigued with walking the deck so long, designed going below to smoke a pipe of tobacco to beguile time and desired the mate to acquaint him immediately should any alteration take place. 
The board next the lower part of the pump had been driven to see how much water was in the well, and every half hour when the ball was struck the carpenter went down. As he had hitherto found no water, Captain Nichols felt quite comfortable in his situation in particular, and on going below ordered a little negro boy, whom he had as an apprentice, to get him a pipe of tobacco. Soon after filling and lighting his pipe he was thrown from his chair while sitting in his stateroom by a blow that the ship received from a terrible sea, on which he dispatched the boy to ask Mr. Fox the mate whether anything was washed over. Mr. Fox returned answer that all was safe, and he saw the violet coming up fast. Captain Nichols, then being greatly fatigued, thought he would endeavor to procure refreshment from a little sleep, and without undressing threw himself on the side of his bed. But before his eyes were closed Mr. Fox came to inform him that the carpenter had found the water above the kelson, and that the ship had certainly sprung a leak. He immediately rose and took the carpenter down to the hold along with him, when to his infinite surprise he heard the water roaring in dreadfully. On further examination he found that a butt had started, and the more they endeavored to press anything into it the more the plank forsook the timber. Therefore they went on deck to encourage the people at the pumps after making a mark with chalk to ascertain how the water gained upon them. Captain Nichols, considering the case desperate, went to all the Frenchmen's cabins, begging them to rise, he said, that although their lives were not in danger their assistance was desired at the pumps, where it would be of the greatest service. They got up accordingly and cheerfully lent their aid. By this time it was daylight, when, to the great surprise and concern of the Duke William's people, they saw the violet on her broadside at a little distance, the foreyard broke in the slings, the fore topsail set, and her crew endeavoring to free her of the mizzenmast. Probably she had just then broached to by the foreyard giving way. A violent squall came on which lasted for ten minutes, and when it cleared up they discovered that the unfortunate ship had gone to the bottom with nearly four hundred souls. The stoutest was appalled by the event, especially as their own fate seemed to be approaching. All the tubs above mentioned were prepared and gangways made. The Frenchmen assisted and also the women who behaved with uncommon resolution. The hatches were then opened, and as the water flowed fast into the hold, the tubs being filled were hauled up and emptied on the upper deck, which with three pumps constantly at work and bailing out of the gun-room scuttle, discharged a great quantity of water. A seam would have done them little injury, but a butt's end was more than they could manage, though every method that could be deemed serviceable was tried. The sprite sail was quilted with oakum and flax, and one of the top gallant sails was prepared in the same manner, to see whether anything would sink into the leak, but all in vain. In this dismal condition the transport continued three days, notwithstanding all the exertions of the people. She was full of water, and they expected her to sink every minute. They had already got the whole liquor and provisions. The hold now being full, and the ship swimming only by the decks from the buoyancy of empty casks below, the people about six o'clock on the fourth morning came to Captain Nichols, declaring that they had done all that lay in their power, that the ship was full of water, and that it was in vain to pump any more. Captain Nichols acknowledged the truth of what they said. He told them that he could not desire them to do more, that they had behaved like brave men and must now trust in providence alone as there was no expedient left for saving their lives. He then acquainted the priest with their situation, that every method for saving the ship and the lives of the people had been adopted, but that he expected the decks to blow up every moment. The priest was stunned by the intelligence, but answered that he would immediately go and give his people absolution for dying, which he did, says Captain Nichols and I think a more melancholy scene cannot be supposed than so many people, hardy, strong, and in health, looking at each other with tears in their eyes, bewailing their unhappy condition. No fancy can picture the seeming distraction of the poor unhappy children clinging to their mothers, and the wives hanging over their husbands lamenting their miserable fate. Shocking situation. Words cannot describe it. Captain Nichols then called the men down the main hatchway along with him to examine the leak in the hold. He told them they must be content with their fate, and as they were certain they had done their duty they should submit to providence with pious resignation. He walked on deck with Captain Moore, desiring him to devise any expedient to save them from perishing. With tears in his eyes Captain Moore assured him that he knew of none, as all that could be thought of had been used. Providence and Captain Nichols' belief induced him to propose attempting to hoist out the boats, so that if a ship should appear their lives might be saved as the gale was more moderate. But to this proposal Captain Moore said it would be impossible, 
as everybody would endeavor to get into them. Captain Nichols, however, was of a different opinion, observing that under their severe trial the sailors had behaved with uncommon resolution, and were very obedient to his commands. He flattered himself that they would all continue so, and all were sensible, that in case the ship broached to, the masts must be cut away to prevent her from oversetting, when it would be beyond their power to hoist out the boats. He then called the mates, carpenters, and men, and proposed to get out the boats, at the same time acquainting them that it was to save every soul on board, if possible, and declaring that if any person should be so rash as to insist on going into them, besides those he should think proper, that they should immediately be scuttled. But all solemnly maintained that his commands should be as implicitly obeyed as if the ship had been in her former good condition, thus setting an example which is rarely to be found. Captain Nichols then went to acquaint the chief prisoner on board with what was about to be attempted. He was an hundred and ten years old, the father of the whole island of St. John's, and had a number of children, grandchildren, and other relations in the ship. His observation was that he was convinced Captain Nichols would not do a bad action, for, by experience, he had found how much care he had taken of him and his friends, and likewise what endeavors had been used to save the ship and their lives. Therefore they were ready to assist in anything he should propose. Captain Nichols assured him that he would not forsake them, but run an equal chance. This he thought the only means of saving their lives, should it please Providence to send any ship to their assistance, and it was their duty to use all means given to them. He next asked Mr. Fox and the carpenter whether they were willing to venture in the longboat, to which they boldly answered in the affirmative, as whether they perished on the spot or a mile or two farther off was a matter of very little consequence, and as there was no prospect but death in remaining, they would willingly make the attempt. Captain Moore, the carpenter and mate, also willingly agreed to his proposal to go in the cutter. The cutter was accordingly got over the side, and the ship lying pretty quiet, they cut the tackles, when she dropped very well into the water, and the pinter brought her up. They next went to work with the longboat, and daylight having fairly come in, gave them great spirits. As they flattered themselves, should it please God Almighty to send a ship, it would be in their power to save all their lives, the weather being now much more moderate than before. The maiden carpenter having cut the runners, the longboat fell into the water as well as the cutter had done, and a proper penter being made fast, she brought up properly. People were stationed at the main and fore topmast heads to look out for a sail, when to the unspeakable joy of all on board, the man at the main topmast cried out that he saw two ships right astern, making after the transport. Captain Nichols having acquainted the priest and the old gentleman with the good news, the latter took him in his aged arms and wept for joy. The captain ordered the ensign to be hoisted to the main topmast shrouds, and the guns to be got all clear for firing. The weather was very hazy, and the ships not far distant when first discovered. Whenever the transport hoisted her signal of distress, they showed English colors and seemed to be West India men of about three or four hundred tons. Captain Nichols continued loading and firing as fast as possible when he perceived the two ships speak with each other, and setting their foresail and topsails, they hauled their wind and stood off. Supposing that the size of his ship and her having so many men on board added to its being the time of war might occasion distrust, he ordered the mainmast to be cut away to undeceive them. People had been placed in the shrouds to cut away in case of necessity but one of the shrouds not being properly cut checked the mainmast and made it fall right across the boats. On this Captain Nichols hastily ran aft and cut the penders of both boats, otherwise they would have been staved to pieces and sunk immediately. A dismal thing it was to cut away what could be the only means of saving people's lives and at the same time see the ships so basely leave them. No words can picture their distress. Driven from the greatest joy to the utmost despair, Death now appeared more dreadful. They had only the foresail hanging in the brails, and the braces of both penders being rendered useless by the fall of the mainmast and the yard flying backward and forward by the rolling of the ship rendered them apprehensive that she would instantly overset. The ship ran from the boats until they remained just in sight, and finding they made no endeavor to join her, though each was provided with oars, foremast, and foresail, Captain Nichols consulted with the boatswain on what was most proper to be done in their dangerous condition. He said that he thought they should bring the ship to at all events, though he acknowledged it a dreadful alternative to hazard her oversetting, 
The boatswain agreed that it was extremely dangerous, as the vessel steered very well. However, Captain Nichols, finding that the men in the boat did not attempt to join him, called the people aft and told them his resolution. They said it was desperate, and so was their condition, but they were ready to do whatever he thought best. But Captain Moore seemed to be quite against it. Captain Nichols then acquainted the old gentleman, the priest, and the rest of the people, who were pleased to say, let the consequence be what it might, they should be satisfied he had acted for the best, and all were resigned to the consequences. He therefore ordered men to every fore shroud, and one with an axe to the foremast to cut it away, should that measure become indispensable. But his own situation he declares to have been in the meantime dreadful, in reflecting that this alternative, though in his judgment right, might be the means of sending nearly four hundred souls to eternity. However, the Almighty endowed him with resolution to persevere, and he gave orders to bring the ship to. In hauling out the mizzen, which had been greatly chaffed, it split. A new staysail was then bent to bring the ship to, which had the desired effect after a considerable time, for a heavy sea striking on the starboard quarter excited an apprehension that it would be necessary to cut away the mast. When the men in the yawl saw the ship lying to for them, they got up their foremast and ran on board, holding the sheets in their hands on account of the wind, and as soon as they arrived some men were sent to row to the assistance of the longboat. They soon joined her, got her foremast up, set the sail, as the cutter likewise did, and to the great joy of all reached the ship in safety. Just as the boats came up, the people at the masthead exclaimed, A sail! A sail! and the captain thought it better to let the ship lie, as by seeing the mainmast gone it might be known that she was in distress. The weather was hazy, and he could see to no great distance, but the strange vessel was soon near enough to perceive and hear his guns. She had scarce hoisted her colors, which were Danish, when her main topsail sheet gave away, on observing which Captain Nichols, conceiving her main topsail was to be clued up, and she would come to his assistance, immediately imparted the good news to the priest and the rest. Poor deluded people! They hugged him in their arms, calling him their friend and preserver. But alas, it was short-lived joy. For as soon as the Dane had nodded or spliced her topsail sheet, she stood away and left them. What pen is able, says Captain Nichols, to describe the despair that reigned in the ship? The poor unhappy people, wringing their hands, cried out that God had forsaken them. It was now about three in the afternoon. Captain Nichols wore the ship, which she bore very well, and steered tolerably before the wind. Towards half an hour afterwards the old gentleman came to him in tears, and taking him in his arms said he came by desire of the whole people to request that he and his men would endeavor to save their lives in the boats, and as these were insufficient to carry more, they would by no means be accessory to their destruction. They were well convinced by their whole conduct that they had done everything in their power for their preservation, but that God Almighty had ordained them to perish, though they trusted he and his men would get safe on shore. Such gratitude for only doing a duty in endeavoring to save the lives of the prisoners as well as their own astonished Captain Nichols. He replied that there was no hopes of life, and as all had embarked in the same unhappy voyage they should all take the same chance. He thought that they ought to share the same fate. The old gentleman said that should not be and if he did not acquaint his people with the offer he should have their lives to answer for. Accordingly the captain mentioned it to Captain Moore and the people. They said that they would with the greatest satisfaction remain could anything be devised for the preservation of the others, but that being impossible they would not refuse to comply with their request. The people then thanking them for their great kindness with tears in the eyes of all hastened down the stern ladder. As the boats ranged up by the sea under the ship's counter, those that went last cast themselves down and were caught by the men in the boat. Captain Nichols told them he trusted to their honor that they would not leave him, as he was determined not to quit the ship until it was dark, in hopes that Providence would yet send something to their aid. The whole assured him that he should not be deserted. He had a little Norse boy on board whom no entreaties could persuade to enter the boat until he himself had done so. But as it was growing dark he insisted on the boy's going, saying he would immediately follow him. The boy obeyed and got on the stern ladder when a Frenchman, whom the dread of death induced to quit his wife and children unperceived, made over the taffrail and trod on the Norse boy's fingers. The boy screamed aloud which led Captain Nichols to believe that some person was in danger, and on repairing to the place, followed by the old gentleman, they found to their great surprise that the man who had a wife and children on board 
was attempting to get away and save himself. The old gentleman calling him by his name said he was sorry to find him base enough to desert his family. He seemed ashamed of what he had done and returned over the taffrail. By this time the people of the boat begged the captain to come, as the blows she received from below the ship's counter were likely to sink her. Captain Nichols, seeing the priest stretching his arms over the rails in great emotion, and apparently under strong apprehensions of death, asked him whether he was willing to take his chance in the boat. He replied in the affirmative if there was room, and on learning that there was, he immediately went and gave the people his benediction, and after saluting the old gentleman, tucked up his conical robes, and forsook the vessel. Captain Nichols saluted him likewise and several others, and then left them praying for his safety. When he entered the boat he bid the sailors cast her adrift. It was very dark, and they had neither moon nor stars to direct them. What a terrible situation, he exclaims. We were twenty-seven in the longboat and nine in the cutter without victuals or drink. Uncertain of their distance from the English coast, they agreed to keep as close as possible to the ship. It began to blow very fresh with sleet and snow. The people were fatigued to the uttermost from working so long at the pumps, and after sitting in the wet and cold, they began to wish that they had stayed in the ship and perished, as now they might die a lingering death. Either alternative was awful. Destitute of provision, it was most probable that one must be sacrificed by lot to keep the others alive, and their dismal situation in arousing the most horrible anticipations made them forebode the worst. The boats now began to make water, yet the men refused to bail them. They were in a state of such extreme weariness and not having slept for four nights, became regardless of their fate. Captain Nichols nevertheless prevailed on them to free the longboat of water. Having a brisk gale, they soon ran a long way from their unfortunate ship, when to their great distress it fell quite calm at ten in the morning. This threw the people in despair. Their courage began to fail, and as they could not expect to live so long as to make the land, death seemed again staring them in the face. Some time after this unlucky party forsook the ship, four of the French prisoners led a small jolly boat, which was still remaining overboard with two small paddles, and swam to her and just as they left the vessel, her decks blew up with a report like a gun. She sunk in the ocean, and three hundred and sixty souls perished with her. Captain Nichols, at length observing the water colored, asked whether they had any twine on which one of them gave him a ball from his pocket. They knocked the bolts off the knees of the longboat, wherewith to make a deep sea lead, and sounding with it were rejoiced to find only forty-five fathom water. But the people complaining greatly of hunger and thirst, Captain Nichols said he was sorry to acquaint them that he had nothing for them to eat or drink, yet encouraged them to bear up with manly resolution, as by their soundings they were near silly, and he doubted not if it cleared they should see the land. The little Norse boy, who had always kept close by the captain, now said that he had got some bread, and on taking it from the bosom of his shirt it proved to be like baker's dough. However, it was bread, and very acceptable. The whole might amount to about four pounds, and Captain Nichols, having put it into his hat, distributed it equally, calling for those in the yawl to receive their share. But instead of being a relief, it increased their troubles, for being wet and clammy, it clung to the roof of their mouths, having nothing to wash it down. Mr. Fox had some allspice also, which was of little service, having been cut in pieces. The people forced it down their throats, which created some saliva, and by that means it was swallowed. About noon a light air sprung up at southwest. Each boat had a foremast, foresail, and oars, but owing to the boats having been foul of the mainmast, all the oars were washed away except two from each. Captain Nichols was told in answer to his inquiries concerning a noise among the crew, that two seamen were disputing about a couple of blankets which one of them had brought from the ship. These blankets he ordered to be thrown overboard, rather than they should be suffered to breed any quarrel, as in their unhappy condition it was no time to have disputes. But on reflection, having desired that they should be brought to him, he thought of converting them to use, by forming each into a mainsail. Therefore one oar was erected for a mainmast, and the other broke to the breadth of the blankets for a yard. The people in the cutter observing what was done in the longboat converted a hammock which they had on board into a mainsail. At four in the afternoon it cleared up when the adventurers descried a brig about two miles distant to which Captain Nichols ordered the cutter to give chase as it being lighter than the longboat would sooner get up and let her know their distress. 
but the brig seeing the boats alter their course directly stood from them owing as captain nichols supposed to their odd appearance for war then prevailing they were probably taken for the french lug sail boats that used to frequent the lands off scilly the cutter however gained fast on the brig when having got about half way a very thick fog came on and neither the brig nor the cutter were again seen from the longboat night fell and the weather still continuing very foggy the people almost dead for want of sleep reposed themselves sitting half way in water it being impossible for so many to find seats their captain anxious for their lives in his own strove to keep his eyes open though it was the fifth night that he had taken no rest about eleven o'clock when every one was asleep but the helmsman and himself he thought that he saw land yet he was determined not to call out land until he should be sure that it was so he squeezed his eyelids together to let the water run out of his eyes as he found them very dim again he thought he saw land very plain and was convinced that he could not be deceived by this time the man at the helm had dropped asleep and he took the tiller himself some space longer elapsed before he would disturb anybody but at last he awoke captain moore telling him he thought he saw land captain moore only answered that they should never see land again captain nichols then awoke mr fox who had obtained a sound sleep and seemed quite refreshed he immediately cried out that they were near land and close in with the breakers lucky it was that he had been awakened otherwise captain nichols from being absolutely unacquainted with them was satisfied that all on board would have perished at the word land every one awoke and with some difficulty the boat cleared the rocks at first the precise part of the english coast could not be ascertained but as it cleared more and more every moment captain nichols on looking under the lee leech of the blanket mainsail discerned st michael's mound in mounts bay the boat would not fetch the land near penzance and as she had no oars it was determined to avoid steering round the lizard and so for falmouth but to run her boldly on shore whatever place she might chance to make it was a fine night and after getting round the point the people found the water very smooth keeping the boat close to the wind they made between penzance and the point their joy at finding themselves in so favourable a situation is not to be conceived it gave them new life and strength those who were forward exclaimed that there were two rocks ahead captain nichols hastened before and his sight having come well to him he carried the boat between them without touching ground and in a little time ran her ashore on a sandy beach the seamen leapt into the water and carried the priest and the captain ashore the former kneeling down made a short prayer and then coming to embrace captain nichols called him his preserver and said that he had rescued him from death leaving the boat as she lay all made the best of their way to the town of penzance but some of the people with sleeping wet were so much benumbed that they could scarce get along and captain nichols himself declares that from the time of the ship springing a leak until that hour he had had no sleep and very little sustenance however having fallen in with a run of fresh water on the road to penzance all were revived by drinking heartily of it the party reaching the town about three in the morning made up to a tavern where they saw a light and as it had been a market day the mistress of the house was still up when captain nichols entered by the door which was not locked she was undressing with her back to a fire the light he had seen and being greatly alarmed screamed murder thieves the appearance of twenty-seven people at such an unseasonable hour was certainly enough to create apprehension especially from the condition which they were in but the captain endeavouring to pacify her requested she would call her husband or servants as they were shipwrecked men and give them some refreshment the landlord soon came and having provided provisions the people got into as many beds as were there while the rest of them slept on the floor by the side of the fire next morning the captain accompanied by the priest went to the mayor of the town to make a protest before a notary and to see if he could get credit as both he and the people were in want of every necessary and it was many miles to london the mayor received him kindly but told him that he was no merchant and that he never supplied people in the condition that he was in with money but if he pleased he would send a servant with him to mr charles langford a merchant who generally supplied the masters of vessels in distress with necessaries mr langford received captain nichols politely but in answer to his request for credit said that he had made a resolution not to supply with credit any man to whom he was an entire stranger as he had been deceived by one very lately and though his might have been a large ship to judge by the boat which was come on shore he the captain might not be concerned in her 
and as he should want a great deal of money, he should beg to be excused. Captain Nichols answered that he was partly owner of the ship, and Mr. Langford might be certain that his bills were duly honored. However, he said he could not do it. Captain Nichols, grievously disappointed, returned to the inn where several tradesmen had arrived to furnish the people with clothes and other necessaries. He told the latter he could get no credit, but that they must travel on as far as Exeter, where he was sure of obtaining relief, which was very unwelcome news, as most of the people wanted shoes. The captain next requested the landlord of the inn to get them some breakfast, but he desired to be excused and wished to know if the captain could get no credit how he was to be paid. Captain Nichols was quite at a loss how to act, being denied both credit and victuals. He thought he would pawn or sell his ring, watch, buckles, and buttons. Accordingly, returning to Mr. Langford, he begged he would give him what he thought proper for these things. He took the ring from his finger, the watch from his pocket, and with tears in his eyes was going to take the buckles from his shoes. When Mr. Langford prevented him, saying he should have credit for as much as he pleased, for he believed him to be an honest man, and saw that his people's distress touched him more, if possible, than his own misfortunes. He then gave what money the captain required. During these transactions the second mate and the eight men belonging to the cutter arrived. They said it was so very thick they could not come up with the brig which they were in pursuit of, and that seeing the land's end when it cleared they got ashore. As nobody would buy the cutter, they had left her and had inquired the way to Penzance, where, being in great distress, they rejoiced to meet their comrades. Captain Nichols went to the inn and discharged what was owing. On account of the unkindness which he had experienced, he resolved to stay no longer and repaired to another house to breakfast. He next procured the necessaries wanted by his people, and then went with his mates to make a protest. But, not choosing that the declaration should proceed from his own mouth, Mr. Langford's son acted as interpreter to the French priest who was to make it. The priest accordingly made a strong and full affidavit that Captain Nichols and his people had tried every means to keep the ship above water, that they had used the French all the time they were on board with the greatest kindness and humanity, and that Captain Nichols had parted from them with the greatest reluctance, and even at their own desire went into the boat, after all hopes of life were gone. Having remained another day at Penzance to refresh the people and getting credit for what was wanted, Captain Nichols, Captain Moore, and the officers set out in a carriage for Exeter, while the people who had got a pass from the mayor walked on foot. At Redruth, the town in Cornwall, there were many French officers on parole, as also an English commissary. Captain Nichols accompanied the priest to the latter in quest of a pass to Falmouth, that he might embark in the first cartel for France, and here took leave of him. Captain Nichols, having reached London, was under the necessity of being examined at the Admiralty and Navy Office about the loss of the people in the ship, she being a transport in the service of government. The Lords of the Admiralty and Commissioners of the Navy told him that he might say more than any man living, as he had brought ashore with him the first man of France, a priest, of course an enemy to both their religion and country. If his behavior had not been good, he would not have attempted it but at the same time they acknowledged that without such a proof they could not have believed, but finding all hopes gone, he and his people got away by some stratagem. They would pay, they said, to the hour that the ship foundered, and were very sorry they could do no more. The four Frenchmen above mentioned, who had left the transport in the little boat subsequent to the departure of Captain Nichols and his men, got into Falmouth within two days. So ended this dreadful and unfortunate voyage with the loss of a fine ship and three hundred and sixty souls. End of chapter 44 Recording by Philip Gould Chapter 45 of Thrilling Narratives of Mutiny, Murder, and Piracy This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Thrilling Narratives of Mutiny, Murder, and Piracy by Anonymous Chapter 45 Commodore Barney No old triton who has passed his calms under the bows of a longboat could say of Joshua Barney that he came into a master's berth through the cabin windows. He began at the rudiments, and well he understood the science. All his predilections were for the sea. Having deserted the counting-room, young Barney, at the age of twelve, was placed for nautical instruction in a pilot-boat at Baltimore, till he was apprenticed to his brother-in-law. At the age of fourteen he was appointed second mate, with the approbation of the owners, 
and before he was sixteen he was called upon to take charge of his ship at sea, in which the master had died. This was on a voyage to Nice. The ship was in such a state that it was barely possible to make Gibraltar, where, for necessary repairs, he pledged her for seven hundred pounds, to be repaid by the consigne at Nice, who, however, declined, and called in the aid of the governor to compel Barney to deliver the cargo, which he had refused to do. He was imprisoned, but set at large on some intimation that he would do as desired. But when he came on board, he struck his flag, and removed his crew, choosing to consider his vessel as captured. He then set out for Milan, to solicit the aid of the British ambassador there, in which he succeeded so well that the authorities of Nice met him on his return to apologize for their conduct. The assignee paid the bond, and Barney sailed for Alicant, where his vessel was detained for the use of the great armada, then fitting out against Algiers, the fate of which was a total and shameful defeat. On his return home, his employer was so well satisfied with his conduct that he became his firm friend ever after. He soon offered himself as second-in-command on board the sloop Hornet, of ten guns, one of two vessels then preparing for a cruise under Commodore Hopkins, for this was in the early part of the Revolution. The sloop fell in with a British tender, which she might have captured, but for the timidity of the American captain. The tender, mistaking her enemy, ran alongside and exposed herself to much danger. Barney stood by one of the guns as the enemy came near, and was about to apply the match when the bold commander commanded him to desist. Barney, whose spirit revolted at such a cause, threw his matchstick at the captain, with such force that the iron point stuck in the door of the roundhouse. This, in a youth not seventeen, urged well for the pugnacity of the man. At the end of this cruise he volunteered on board the schooner Wasp, in which he soon had a brush with the Roebuck and another frigate, and with the aid of some galleys in which he had a command, the enemy was forced to retreat, with more loss than honor. Barney, for his good conduct in this affair, was appointed to the command of the sloop Sachem, with the commission of lieutenant before he was seventeen. Before the cruise, however, Captain Robinson took command of the Sachem, which soon had an action with a letter of mark of superior force and numbers. It was well contested, and nearly half the crew of the brig were killed or wounded. In about two hours the letter of mark struck. The captors secured a valuable prize in a cargo of rum, and also a magnificent turtle intended as a present to Lord North, whose name was marked on the shell. This acceptable West Indian, Lieutenant Barney presented to a better man than it had been designed for, for he gave it to the Honorable R. Morris. On the return of the Sachem, both officers were transferred to a fine brig of fourteen guns, the Andrew Doria, which forthwith captured the racehorse, of twelve guns and a picked crew. This vessel was of the Royal Navy, and had been detached by the Admiral purposely to take the Doria. On this voyage a snow was captured, in which the lieutenant went as prize-master, making up the crew partly of the prisoners. Being hard by an enemy's ship, he discovered signs of mutiny among his crew, and shot the ringleader in the shoulder, a proceeding that offered so little encouragement to his comrades that they obeyed orders and made sail, but it was too late to escape. The purser of the frigate which captured him was on a subsequent occasion so much excited as to strike Barney, who knocked him down, and went further in his resentment than fair fighting permits, for he kicked him down the gangway. The commander obliged the purser to apologize to Barney. Having been captured in the Virginia frigate, which ran aground in the Capes, and was deserted by her commander, Barney, with five hundred other prisoners, was sent round in the St. Albans frigate to New York. As the prisoners were double in number to the crew, Barney formed a plan of taking the ship, which was defeated or prevented by the treachery of a Frenchman. Barney was a prisoner at New York for five months, after which he took the command of a schooner of two guns, and eight men, with a cargo of tobacco for St. Eustia, for he was better pleased to do a little than to do nothing. He was, however, taken, after a running fight, by boarding, by a privateer of four large guns and sixty men. His next cruise was with his friend Robinson in a private ship of ten guns and thirty-five men, in which they encountered the British privateer Rosebud of sixteen guns and one hundred and twenty men. On the return, a letter of mark of sixteen guns and seventy men was captured. The lieutenant now had prize money enough to be converted, on his return, into a large bundle of continental bills, which he stowed away in a chaise box on taking a journey, but which he could not find when he arrived at his destination. He kept his own secret, however, and went to sea again, second in command of the United States ship Saratoga, of sixteen nine-pounders. The first prize was a ship of twelve guns, captured after an action of a few minutes. On the next day, 
the Saratoga hoisted English colors, and came alongside a ship which had two brigs in company. Then, running up the American ensign, she poured in a broadside, while Lieutenant Barney, with fifty men, boarded the enemy. The immediate result was the conquest of a ship of thirty-two guns and ninety men. The two brigs, one of fourteen and the other of four guns, were also captured. The division of prize money would have made the officers rich, but no division took place, for all but the Saratoga were captured by a seventy-four and several frigates. Lieutenant Barney was furnished with bed and board on deck, and with him bed and board were synonymous terms, but he was allowed to choose the softest plank he could find. In England he was confined in prison, from which he escaped, and, after various adventures, arrived at Beverly, Massachusetts, and, as soon as he landed, was offered the command of a privateer of twenty guns. On his arrival at Philadelphia, he accepted the command of one of several vessels cruising against the enemy's barges and the refugee boats that infested the Delaware River and Bay. His ship was the Hyder Alley, a small vessel of sixteen six-pounders. As a superior vessel of the enemy was approaching, Barney directed his steersman to interpret his commands by the rule of contraries. When the enemy was ranging alongside, Barney cried out, Hard a port! The helmsman clapped his helm the other way, and the enemy's jib-boom caught in the fore-rigging, and held her in a position to be raked, and never was the operation of raking more suddenly or effectually performed. The British flag came down in less than half an hour, and the captors made little delay for compliments, for a frigate from the enemy was rapidly approaching. The prize was the General Marl of the Royal Navy, with twenty nine-pounders and one hundred and thirty-six men, nearly double the force and metal of the captors. After the peace, Commodore Barney made a partial settlement in Kentucky, and became a favorite with the old hunters of that pleasant land. He was appointed clerk of the District Court of Maryland, and also an auctioneer. He also engaged in commerce, when his business led him to Cape Francois during the insurrection, and where he armed his crew, and fought his way, to carry off some specie which he had secreted in barrels of coffee. On his return, he was captured by a pirate, which called herself an English privateer. Barney, however, was a bad prisoner, and with a couple of his hands rose upon the buccaneers and captured their ship. In this situation, it was no time for Argus himself to sleep, with more than an eye at a time. The Commodore slept only by day in an armed chair on deck, with his sword between his legs and pistols in his belt, while his cook and boatswain, well armed, stood the watch at his side. On another occasion, he was captured in the West Indies by an English frigate, where he received the usual British courtesies, and he was tried in Jamaica for piracy, etc. It is needless to say that, though in an enemy's country, he was acquitted by acclamation. This accusation originated with the commander of the frigate, who, however, prudently kept out of sight. Though an officer in the same frigate expressed at a coffee-house a desire to meet Barney, without knowing that he was present, that he might have an opportunity to settle accounts with the rascal. The rascal bestowed upon the officer the compliments that were usual on such an occasion, and tweaked that part of his head which is so prominent in an elephant. We could not follow the Commodore through his subsequent fortunes and adventures. In France he received the hug fraternal of the President of the Convention, and the commission of captain of the highest grade in the Navy. He fitted out several vessels of his own to harass the British trade, in which he was very successful. He received the command of two frigates, which were almost wrecked in the storm, though he succeeded in saving them. In the last war, his services are more immediately in our memories. End of chapter 45 Recording by Todd Chapter 46 of Thrilling Narratives of Mutiny, Murder, and Piracy This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by K. Hand. Thrilling Narratives of Mutiny, Murder, and Piracy by Anonymous. Chapter 46. Naval Battles of the United States. The depredations committed on American commerce in the Mediterranean by the piratical corsairs of the Barbary powers induced Congress in 1794 to authorize the formation of a naval force for its protection. Four ships of 44 guns each and two of 36 were ordered to be built. Captain Thomas Truxton was one of the first six captains appointed by the President at the organization of the naval establishment in 1794. 
he was appointed to the command of the constellation of thirty-six guns and ordered to protect the commerce of the united states in the west indies from the ravages of the french on the ninth of february seventeen ninety nine he captured the french frigate insurgente of which twenty-nine of the crew were killed and forty-four wounded the constellation had but one man killed and two wounded in eighteen hundred the constellation engaged with the french frigate vengeance of fifty-four guns near guadalupe but owing to the darkness of the night the latter escaped after having thrice struck her colors and lost one hundred and sixty men in the engagement the same year the united states frigate boston captured the french national corvette le berceau in the month of august eighteen o one captain sterrett of the united states schooner enterprise of twelve guns and ninety men fell in off malta with a tripolitian cruiser of fourteen guns and eighty-five men in this action the tripolitians thrice hauled down her colors and thrice perfidiously renewed the conflict fifty of her men were killed and wounded the enterprise did not lose a man captain sterrett's instructions not permitting him to make a prize of the cruiser he ordered her crew to throw overboard all their guns and powder and to go and tell their countrymen the treatment they might expect from a nation determined to pay tribute only in powder and ball on her arrival at tripoli so great was the terror produced that the sailors abandoned the cruisers then fitting out and not a man could be procured to navigate them the tripolitian cruisers continuing to harass the vessels of the united states congress determined in eighteen o three to fit out a fleet that should chastise their insolence the squadron consisted of the constitution forty four guns the philadelphia forty four the argus eighteen the siren sixteen the nautilus sixteen the vixen seventeen and the enterprise fourteen Commodore Preble was appointed to the command of this squadron in May 1803, and on the 13th of August sailed in the Constitution for the Mediterranean. Having adjusted the difficulties which had sprung up with the Emperor of Morocco, he turned his whole attention to Tripoli. The season was, however, too far advanced for active operations. On the 31st of October, the Philadelphia, being at nine o'clock in the morning about five leagues to the westward of tripoli discovered a sail in shore standing before the wind to the eastward the philadelphia immediately gave chase the sail hoisted tripolitian colors and continued her course near the shore the philadelphia opened a fire upon her and continued it till half past eleven when being in seven fathoms water and finding her fire could not prevent the vessel entering tripoli she gave up the pursuit in beating off she ran on a rock not laid down in any chart distant four and a half miles from the town a boat was immediately lowered to sound the greatest depth of water was found to be astern in order to back her off all sails were laid back the top gallant sails loosened three anchors thrown away from the bows the water in the hold started and all the guns thrown overboard excepting a few abaft to defend the ship against the attacks of the tripolitian gunboats then firing at her all this however proved ineffectual as did also the attempt to lighten her forward by cutting away her foremast the philadelphia had already withstood the attack of the numerous gunboats for four hours when a large reinforcement coming out of tripoli and being herself deprived of every means of resistance and defence she was forced to strike about sunset the tripolitians immediately took possession of her and made prisoners of the officers and men in number three hundred forty-eight hours afterwards the wind blowing in shore the tripolitians got the frigate off and towed her into the harbour on the fourteenth of december commodore preble sailed from malta in company with the enterprise commanded by lieutenant stephen decatur when the latter was informed of the loss of the philadelphia he immediately formed a plan of recapturing and destroying her which he proposed to commodore preble at first the commodore thought the projected enterprise too hazardous but at length granted his consent lieutenant decatur then selected for the enterprise the ketch intrepid lately captured by him this vessel he manned with seventy volunteers chiefly of his own crew and on the third of february sailed from syracuse accompanied by the brig siren lieutenant stuart after a tempestuous passage of fifteen days the two vessels arrived off the harbor of tripoli towards the close of the day it was determined that at ten o'clock in the evening the intrepid should enter the harbor accompanied by the boats of the siren but a change of wind had separated the two vessels six or eight miles as delay might prove fatal lieutenant decatur entered the harbor alone about eight o'clock 
the philadelphia lay within half gunshot of the bashaw's castle and principal battery on her starboard quarter lay two tripolitian cruisers within two cables length and on the starboard bow a number of gunboats within half gunshot all her guns were mounted and loaded three hours were in consequence of the lightness of the wind consumed in passing three miles when being within two hundred yards of the philadelphia they were hailed from her and ordered to anchor on peril of being fired into the pilot on board the intrepid was ordered to reply that all their anchors were lost the americans had advanced within fifty yards of the frigate when the wind died away into a calm lieutenant decatur ordered a rope to be taken out and fastened to the fore chains of the frigate which was done and the intrepid warped alongside it was not till then the tripolitians suspected them to be an enemy and their confusion in consequence was great as soon as the vessels were sufficiently near lieutenant decatur sprang on board the frigate and was followed by midshipman morris it was a minute before the remainder of the crew succeeded in mounting after them but the turks crowded together on the quarter-deck were in too great consternation to take advantage of this delay as soon as a sufficient number of americans gained the deck they rushed upon the tripolitians who were soon overpowered and about twenty of them were killed after taking possession of the ship a firing commenced from the tripolitian batteries and castle and from two cruisers near the ship a number of launches were also seen rowing about in the harbor whereupon lieutenant decatur resolved to remain in the frigate for there he would be enabled to make the best defense but perceiving that the launches kept at a distance he ordered the frigate to be set on fire which was immediately done and so effectually that with difficulty was the intrepid preserved a favorable breeze at this moment sprung up which soon carried them out of the harbor none of the americans were killed and only four wounded for this heroic achievement lieutenant decatur was promoted to the rank of post captain his commission was dated on the day he destroyed the philadelphia after the destruction of the philadelphia frigate commodore preble was during the spring and early part of the summer employed in keeping up the blockade of the harbor of tripoli in preparing for an attack upon the town and in cruising a prize that had been taken was put in commission and called the scourge a loan of six gunboats and two bomb vessels completely fitted for service was obtained from the king of naples permission was also given to take twelve or fifteen neapolitans on board each boat to serve under the american flag with this addition to his force the commodore on the twenty first of july joined the vessels off tripoli the number of men engaged in service amounted to one thousand and sixty on the tripolitian castle and batteries one hundred and fifteen guns were mounted fifty-five of which were pieces of heavy ordnance the others long eighteen and twelve pounders in the harbor were nineteen gunboats carrying each a long brass eighteen or twenty-four pounder in the bow and two howitzers abaft also two schooners of eight guns each a brig of ten and two galleys of four guns each in addition to the ordinary turkish garrison and the crews of the armed vessels estimated at three thousand upwards of twenty thousand arabs had been assembled for the defense of the city the weather prevented the squadron from approaching the city until the twenty eighth when it anchored within two miles and a half of the fortifications but the wind suddenly shifting and increasing to a gale the commodore was compelled to return on the third of august he again approached to within two or three miles of the batteries having observed that several of the enemy's boats were stationed without the reef of rocks covering the entrance he made signal for the squadron to come within speaking distance to communicate to the several commanders his intention of attacking the shipping and batteries the gunboats and bomb catches were immediately manned and prepared for action the former were arranged in two divisions of three each at half past one the squadron stood in for the batteries at two the gunboats were cast off at half past two the signal was made for the bomb catches and gunboats to advance and attack at three quarters past two the signal was given for a general action it commenced by the bomb catches throwing shells into the town a tremendous fire immediately commenced from the enemy's batteries and vessels of at least two hundred guns it was immediately returned by the american squadron now within musket shot of the principal batteries at this moment captain decatur with the three gunboats under his command attacked the enemy's eastern division consisting of nine gunboats he was soon in the midst of them the fire of the cannon and musketry was immediately changed to a desperate attack with bayonet spear and sabre captain decatur having grappled a tripolitian boat and boarded her with only fifteen americans in ten minutes her decks were cleared and she was captured three americans were wounded at this moment captain decatur was informed that the gunboat commanded by his brother had engaged and captured a boat belonging to the enemy but that his brother as he stepped on board was treacherously shot by the tripolitian commander who made off with his boat 
Captain Decatur immediately pursued the murderer, who was retreating within the lines. Having succeeded in coming alongside, he boarded with only eleven men. A doubtful contest of twenty minutes ensued. Decatur immediately attacked the Tripolitan commander, who was armed with a spear and cutlass. In parrying the Turk's spear, Decatur broke his sword close to the hilt, and received a slight wound in the right arm and breast, but having seized the spear, he closed, and, after a violent struggle, both fell, Decatur uppermost. The Turk then drew a dagger from his belt, but Decatur caught his arm, drew a pistol from his pocket, and shot him. While they were struggling, the crew of both vessels rushed to the assistance of their commanders, and so desperate had the contest around them been that it was with difficulty that Decatur extricated himself from the killed and wounded that had fallen around him. In this affair, an American manifested the most heroic courage and attachment to his commander. Decatur in the struggle was attacked in the rear by a Tripolitan who had aimed a blow at his head, which must have proved fatal had not this generous-minded tar then dangerously wounded and deprived of the use of both of his hands rushed between him and the sabre the stroke of which he received in his head whereby the skull was fractured this hero however survived and afterwards received a pension from his grateful country all the americans but four were wounded captain decatur brought both of his prizes safe to the american squadron two successive attacks were afterwards made upon tripoli and the batteries effectually silenced the humiliation of this barbarous power was of advantage to all nations the pope made a public declaration that the united states though in their infancy had in this affair done more to humble the anti-christian barbarians on that coast than all the european states had done for a long series of time sir alexander ball a distinguished commander in the british navy addressed his congratulations to commodore preble after the junction of the two squadrons commodore preble obtained leave to return home this he did with the greater pleasure as it would give the command of a frigate to captain decatur on his return to the united states he was received and treated everywhere with that distinguished attention which he had so fully merited congress voted him their thanks and requested the president to present him with an emblematical medal our limits will only allow us to glance briefly at a few of the remaining victories of the american navy a formal declaration of war against great britain was passed by congress on the eighteenth of june eighteen twelve on the nineteenth of august the memorable capture of the british frigate guerre by the constitution under captain hull took place on the nineteenth of october the british sloop of war frolic was taken by the wasp commanded by captain jacob jones before the latter could escape however with her prize being in a very disabled state she was captured by the british seventy four poitiers on the twenty fifth of october the united states under commodore decanter fell in with and captured off the western isles the british frigate macedonian mounting forty nine guns and carrying three hundred and six men the macedonian had one hundred and six men killed and wounded the united states five killed and seven wounded the victory of the constitution over the java followed next and was succeeded by that of the hornet commanded by captain lawrence over the peacock the loss of this brave officer in the subsequent engagement between the chesapeake and shannon was generally lamented by his countrymen on the first of september eighteen thirteen the british brig boxer of fourteen guns was captured by the united states brig enterprise commanded by lieutenant william burroughs who fell in the engagement we must close our notice of american naval history by a brief sketch of some of the most interesting cruises and engagements cruise of the wasp on the 1st of May, 1814, the United States Sloop of War Wasp, of 18 guns and 174 men, Captain Blakely Commander, sailed from Portsmouth, New Hampshire, on a cruise, and on the 28th of June, in latitude 48 degrees 36 minutes, longitude 11 degrees 15 minutes, after having made several captures, she fell in with, engaged, and after an action of 19 minutes, captured His Britannic Majesty's Sloop of War Reindeer, william manners esq commander the reindeer mounted sixteen twenty-four pound carronades two long six or nine pounders and a shifting twelve pound carronade with a complement on board of one hundred and eighteen men she was literally cut to pieces in a line with her ports her upper works boats and spare spars were one complete wreck and a breeze springing up the next day after the action her foremast went by the board when the prisoners having been taken on board the wasp she was set on fire and soon blew up the loss on board the reindeer was twenty-three killed and forty-two wounded her captain being among the former on board the wasp five were killed and twenty-one wounded 
more than one half of the wounded enemy were in consequence of the severity and extent of their wounds put on board a portuguese brig and sent to england the loss of the americans although not so severe as that of the british was owing in degree to the proximity of the two vessels during the action and the extreme smoothness of the sea but chiefly in repelling borders on the eighth of july the wasp put in to laurent france after capturing an additional number of prizes where she remained until the twenty seventh of august when she again sailed on a cruise on the first of september she fell in with the british sloop of war avon of twenty guns commanded by captain abuthnot and after an action of forty-five minutes compelled her to surrender her crew being nearly all killed and wounded the guns were then ordered to be secured and a boat lowered from the wasp in order to take possession of the prize in the act of lowering the boat a second enemy's vessel was discovered astern and standing towards the wasp captain blakely immediately ordered his crew to their quarters prepared everything for action and awaited her coming up in a few minutes after two additional sails were discovered bearing down upon the wasp captain blakely stood off with the expectation of drawing the first from its companions but in this he was disappointed she continued to approach until she came close to the stern of the wasp when she hauled by the wind fired her broadside which injured the wasp but trifling and retraced her steps to join her consorts captain blakely was now necessitated to abandon the avon which had by this time become a total wreck and which soon after sunk the surviving part of her crew having barely time to escape to the other vessels on board of the avon forty were killed and sixty wounded the loss sustained by the wasp was two killed and one wounded the wasp afterwards continued her cruise making great havoc among the english merchant vessels and privateers destroying an immense amount of the enemy's property from the first of may until the twentieth of september she had captured fifteen vessels most of which she destroyed hornet and penguin on the twenty third of march eighteen fifteen as the hornet commanded by captain biddle was about to anchor off the north end of the island of tristan da cunha a sail was seen to the southward which at forty minutes past one hoisted english colors and fired a gun the hornet immediately luffed to hoisted an ensign and gave the enemy a broadside a quick and well-directed fire was kept up from the hornet the enemy gradually drifting nearer with an intention as captain biddle supposed to board the enemy's bowsprit came in between the main and mizzen rigging on the starboard side of the hornet giving him an opportunity to board if he had wished but no attempt was made there was a considerable swell and as the sea lifted the hornet ahead the enemy's bowsprit carried away her mizzen shrouds stern davits and spanker boom and hung upon her larboard quarter at this moment an officer called out that they had surrendered captain biddle directed the marines to stop firing and while asking if they had surrendered received a wound in the neck the enemy just then got clear of the hornet and his foremast and bowsprit both being gone and perceiving preparations to give him another broadside he again called out that he had surrendered it was with great difficulty that captain biddle could restrain his crew from firing into him again as it was certain that he had fired into the hornet after having surrendered from the firing of the first gun to the last time the enemy cried out that he had surrendered was exactly twenty-two minutes the vessel proved to be the british brig penguin of twenty guns a remarkable fine vessel of her class and one hundred and thirty-two men twelve of them supernumeraries from the medway seventy-four received on board in consequence of their being ordered to cruise for the privateer young wasp the penguin had fourteen killed and twenty-eight wounded among the killed was captain dickinson who fell at the close of the action as she was completely riddled and so crippled as to be incapable of being secured and being at a great distance from the united states captain biddle ordered her to be scuttled and sunk the hornet did not receive a single round shot in her hull and though much cut in her sails and rigging was soon made ready for further service her loss was one killed and eleven wounded algerine war immediately after the ratification of peace with great britain in february eighteen fifteen congress in consequence of the hostile conduct of the regency of algiers declared war against that power a squadron was immediately fitted out under the command of commodore decatur consisting of the guerre constellation and macedonian frigates the ontario and epervier sloops of war and the schooners spark spitfire torch and flambeau 
another squadron under commodore bainbridge was soon to follow this armament on the arrival of which it was understood commodore decatur would return to the united states in a single vessel leaving the command of the whole combined force to commodore bainbridge the force under commodore decatur rendezvoused at new york from which port they sailed the twentieth of may eighteen fifteen and arrived in the bay of gibraltar in twenty-five days after having previously communicated with cadiz and tangier in the passage the spitfire torch firefly and ontario separated different times from the squadron in gales but all joined again at gibraltar with the exception of the firefly which sprung her masts and put back to new york to refit having learned at gibraltar that the algerine squadron which had been out into the atlantic had undoubtedly passed up the straits and that information of the arrival of the american force had been sent to algiers by persons in gibraltar commodore decatur determined to proceed without delay up the mediterranean in the hope of intercepting the enemy before he could return to algiers or gain a neutral port on the seventeenth of june off cape de gat he fell in with and captured the algerine frigate mazuda in a running fight of twenty-five minutes after two broadsides the algerine ran below the guerre had four men wounded by musketry the algerines had about thirty killed according to the statement of the prisoners who amounted to four hundred and six in this affair the famous algerine admiral or rice hamida who had long been the terror of this sea was cut into by a cannon shot on the nineteenth day of june off cape palos the squadron fell in with and captured an algerine brig of twenty-two guns the brig was chased close to the shore where she was followed by the epervier spark torch and spitfire to whom she surrendered after losing twenty-three men no americans were either killed or wounded the captured brig with most of the prisoners on board was sent into carthagena from cape palos the american squadron proceeded to algiers where it arrived the twenty eighth of june the treaty which commodore decatur finally succeeded in negotiating with the day was highly favorable the principal articles were that no tribute under any pretext or in any form whatever should ever be required by algiers from the united states of america that all americans in slavery should be given up without ransom that compensation should be made for american vessels captured or property seized or detained at algiers that the persons and property of american citizens found on board an enemy's vessel should be sacred that vessels of either party putting into port should be supplied with provisions at market price and if necessary to be repaired should land their cargoes without paying duty that if a vessel belonging to either party should be cast on shore she should not be given up to plunder or if attacked by an enemy within cannon shot of a fort should be protected and no enemy be permitted to follow her when she went to sea within twenty-four hours in general the rights of americans on the ocean and land were fully provided for in every instance and it was particularly stipulated that all citizens of the united states taken in war should be treated as prisoners of war are treated by other nations and not as slaves but held subject to an exchange without ransom after concluding this treaty so highly honorable and advantageous to this country the commissioners gave up the captured frigate and brig to their former owners commodore decatur dispatched captain lewis in the epervier bearing the treaty to the united states and leaving mr shaler at algiers as consul general to the barbary states proceeded with the rest of the squadron to tunis with the exception of two schooners under captain gamble sent to convoy the algerine vessels home from cartagena having obtained from the bashaw of tunis a full restoration in money for certain outrages which had been sustained by american citizens the squadron proceeded to tripoli where commodore decatur made a similar demand for a similar violation of the treaty subsisting between the united states and the bashaw who had permitted two american vessels to be taken from under the guns of his castle by a british sloop of war and refused protection to an american cruiser lying within his jurisdiction restitution of the full value of these vessels was demanded and the money amounting to twenty five thousand dollars paid by the bashaw into the hands of the american consul after the conclusion of this affair the american consular flag which mr jones the consul had struck in consequence of the violation of neutrality above mentioned was hoisted in the presence of the foreign agents and saluted from the castle with thirty-one guns in addition to the satisfaction thus obtained for unprovoked aggressions the commodore had the pleasure of obtaining the release of ten captives two danes and eight neapolitans the latter of whom he landed at messina after touching at messina and naples the squadron sailed for carthagena on the thirty first of august where commodore decatur was in expectation of meeting the relief squadron under commodore bainbridge on joining that officer at gibraltar he relinquished his command and sailed in the guerre for the united states where he arrived on the twelfth of november eighteen fifteen 
everything being done previous to the arrival of the second division of the squadron under commodore bainbridge that gallant officer had no opportunity of distinguishing himself pursuant to his instructions he exhibited this additional force before algiers tunis and tripoli where they were somewhat surprised at the appearance of the independence seventy four commodore bainbridge sailed from gibraltar thirty-six hours before the guerre and arrived at boston the fifteenth of november end of chapter forty six chapter forty seven of thrilling narratives of mutiny murder and piracy this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by larry wilson thrilling narratives of mutiny murder and piracy by anonymous address to the ocean likeness of heaven agent of power man is thy victim shipwreck thy dower spices and jewels from valley and sea armies and banners are buried in thee what are the riches of mexico's mines to the wealth that far down in thy deep waters shine the proud navies that cover the conquering west thou flingest them to death with one heave of thy breast from the high hills that view thy wreck making shore when the bride of the mariner shrieks at thy roar when like lambs in the tempest or mews in the blast on thy ridge broken billows the canvas is cast how humbly to one with a heart and soul to look on thy greatness and list to its roll to think how that heart in cold ashes shall be while the voices of eternity rises from thee end of chapter forty seven End of Thrilling Narratives of Mutiny, Murder, and Piracy by Anonymous.